after the war, labor. So initially, right after the war, Americans really feared that the demobilization is going to bring like a run of inflation and unemployment like we saw back with World War I. Now we are going to see this a little bit in about like the first 18 months after peace has been brought about. Uh, we are gonna see things like rising prices and strife between labor and management and shortages on a lot of items which led to rising prices as well as confirming this anxiety. But really actually by 1947 and 48, we're gonna see economic expansion that's gonna last for a quarter of a century. So keep in mind, we have the bombing of Japan with the atomic weapons, and it's about a month later that Japan actually surrenders. And so this surrender really took America by surprise. But the moment they surrender, this means an end to the war, which means scaling back defense spending, canceling war contracts, and many soldiers want to come home, which is totally fair. Still, it took probably about a year for all of the soldiers to get back to civilian life and everything. But what happens is these soldiers come home to America and you have shortages on food and consumer goods, but a high demand for these items. And so high demand plus short supply means an inflation of prices. Now, initially this inflation is going to be checked by the Office of Price Administration until about October of 1946. Still, the fact that you have inflation is going to squeeze a lot of factory workers because factory workers had basically accepted wage controls during the war. But prices since 1941 had risen twice as fast as base wages. And so basically people aren't getting paid enough to buy all the items they want to. And so this is going to in turn cause a lot of strikes. And these strikes will interrupt the output of products, meaning an even shorter supply, unfortunately, on the market, which could lead to even higher prices. Um, plus, a lot of these strikes are gonna shut down other factories um, completely because of like lack of supplies. So we're going to get out of this the Employment Act of 1946. This was basically an effort by congressional liberals to ward off the economic crisis by fine tuning like government taxation and spending. Um, there was a proposal during this time period as well for a full employment bill that's ensuring everyone's right to a job, but it was extremely watered down. So when we look at the short term, the Employment Act of 1946 basically was aimed at a problem that actually didn't really come. So there was this prediction that all of these veterans would return to the United States, but workers are gonna be idled by canceled defense contracts. And so we have a lot larger population than in the United States all looking for work. And this could possibly live, uh, bring about like depression levels of unemployment. Even with a lot of women leaving the workforce, which by the way, women leaving the workforce is definitely gonna be helped along by like pamphlets, asking men like questions, oh, would you want your wife to work after the war? And things like that. But the reality of the situation was, even with the canceled defense contracts and everything, people had been saving money during the war and they had not bought consumer items like during the Great Depression and during World War II, and now there's this huge demand for these consumer goods, and there's tons of workers that can produce them. So we actually see employment raised during this time period, which is actually gonna bring us to the Taft-Hartley Act. The Taft-Hartley Act was basically a 10-year effort by conservatives to reverse a lot of the gains made by organized labor during the 1930s. This was specifically passed in 1947 because of anger about continuing strikes. And particularly, it's going to be strikes about coal. So the thing is, coal really was the main source of energy at this time in the United States. 
and the coal industry had actually gotten good wages for coal miners, but keep in mind, inflation has raised prices faster than these wages. And so you get a particularly bad coal strike that unfortunately pairs with a railroad walkout simultaneously in 1946. And basically this convinced a lot of Americans that organized labor needed to be curbed, that they had too much power. And so in November of 1946, Republicans gained control of Congress for the first time actually since 1928, partly because of the reconversion chaos, uh, the labor unrest, and just dissatisfaction with Truman. And so this is when they bring forth the Taft-Hartley Act. This was a serious counterattack by big business specifically against unions. So the Taft-Hartley Hartley Act would outlaw several union tools. So for instance, it would bar the closed shop. A closed shop would be the requirement that all workers hired in a given company or plant had to be union workers. Um, we see it also would block secondary boycotts. Secondary boycotts were basically strikes against a supplier or customers of a targeted business. Also, it would allow the federal government to come in and interfere in a strike and basically postpone a strike by imposing a so-called cooling off period that would actually allow the business time to stockpile their products before the strike would be allowed. Though that would defeat a lot of the purpose of the strike. The other thing that we see at this time is that the officers of these kinds of like national unions had to swear that they weren't communists or communist sympathizers but like corporate executives didn't have to make this swear so we're definitely seeing there's this element of fear of communism that is going to eventually bring us into like the second red scare and everything like that this bill uh, the tart the taft hartley act is going to be passed over truman's veto actually <laughs> 